Hello, and welcome back to the RSET training, Applications of NASA's Sport Land Information System Soil Moisture Data for Drought. My name is Sean McCartney, and I'm an RSET trainer based out of NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. It's a pleasure to welcome you all to the third and final part of the webinar series. The following slides will provide an overview of today's training. According to the World Health Organization, an estimated 55 million people globally are affected by droughts every year. Traditional drought applications and indices focus on sensible weather and precipitation trends and their impacts on the hydrologic system. This training is focused on the introduction of NASA Land Information System, or LIS, output of soil moisture at various depths for drought analysis and monitoring. Soil moisture plays an important role in drought monitoring. LIS output of soil moisture will enable a more efficient drought analysis via a gridded product at relatively high spatial resolution, as opposed to sparse in situ measurements of weather parameters and even less dense soil moisture and vegetation health in situ observations. The spatial tracking and analysis of soil moisture by LIS provides a unique tool for those monitoring drought locally compared to large scale traditional indices forced by weather factors. After participating in this three-part training, a user will be able to apply LIS output to efficiently analyze drought over large spatial areas in conjunction with current practices and to integrate this capability with existing data. The, tra the training learning objectives are to identify the NASA LIS basics regarding the framework, input forcing, static fields, land service modeling structure, and output most relevant to drought. Summarize the derived soil moisture percentile products and how these are created. Apply sport LIS output and or derived products to both complement existing data and overcome limitations to monitoring drought over large areas. Recognize best practices for LIS impact related to drought. And configure LIS output file for viewing within a GIS-based display tool and for tailored output products and graphics. The prerequisites for the three-part training are the RSET's Fundamentals of Remote Sensing, Session 1, download and install QGIS and all accompanying software, register for a Google Colab via Gmail or a Gmail-enabled account, and basic Python experience is beneficial but not required. All materials and recordings from each session of the webinar series are currently available on the training web page. In Part 3, the focus will be on accessing data at organization and individual levels. Following each session, there will be a self-paced micro lesson, which will not be graded, but will serve as a knowledge check and prepare you for all of the webinar series, as well as the final homework assignment. There will be one homework assignment, which will be posted today with the due date of June 14th. A certificate of completion will be awarded to those who attend all live sessions and complete the homework assignment before the given due date. Listed below are the trainers for today's webinar. Jonathan Case is a research meteorolo meteorologist with NASA Sport at NASA Marshall Space Flight Center. Matthew Smith is a ra research scientist with NASA Sport at NASA Marshall, Sp Marshall Sp Space Flight Center. Ryan Wade is a research scientist with NASA Sport at NASA Marshall Space Flight Center. And Chris Hain is a physical research scientist at NASA Marshall Space Flight Center and a project lead for NASA Sport. The objectives for the third part of the webinar series are as follows. By the end of part three, participants will be able to access Sport Liz continental United States and East Africa output via Sport Web Viewer, acquire and display Sport Liz continental United States geotiffs via QGIS, and read and display outputs for Sport Liz tailored to users need, user needs and custom domains using Google Colab and Jupyter. Questions are strongly encouraged. If you have any questions, please put them in the question box and we will address them at the end of the webinar in the order that they were received. Feel free to enter your questions as we go. We will try to get to all of the questions during the Q&A session after the pre presentations have concluded. If we run out of time, the remainder of the questions will be answered in the Q&A document, which will be posted to the training website roughly one week after the training. We will now transition to Jonathan Case to learn about 
the web page interface for SportLiz output. Jonathan, over to you. Thanks and welcome everyone. This is Jonathan Case again here for session three. And in this brief tour, we're going to take a look at the SportList web page viewer for displaying SportList graphics and the capabilities and the various geographical zooms. So let me start off first by doing a Google search of the NASA Sport page. And we're just going to go uh, straight to the Sport page here. And at this point, I'm going to zoom in a little bit to make sure everyone can see this fine. So what we're going to do is we're going to navigate to the Sport Viewer, which is underneath Data and Products. And we're going to click on Sport Viewer. And underneath Data Set, we are going to bring up Lists. And if I expand the List menu by clicking on it, you'll see that there's a whole variety of geographical zooms underneath here. So let's start off with the continental US and we'll load the default image. The default image is going to be relative soil moisture and integrated over layers one to three or zero to 100 centimeters. So here's the default viewer that comes up. And if we go ahead and animate it, it's going to show the last 20 images that show up on here. So we can pause that animation. And Let's next go and look at a survey of the various graphical fields that are available underneath product. So let's just scroll through this briefly. And we can see there's a whole variety of, of fields that you can view. So let's go ahead and change the times now on this 0 to 100 centimeter relative soil moisture. What we're going to do is go to the bottom of the page here. And you can select a starting image. It goes back as much as three months. So let's just start with, let's go back to the 1st of May here. And these are hourly output fields. So there's going to be a lot of times to select on many of these images that are in hourly form. And let's just do the first two weeks of May. I'm going to go down to May 14th here and just go to, let's do 0Z the May 15th. I'm using my mouse wheel to scroll up and down through these times. So now we have the first two weeks of May and we can animate this. And you could see the rainy system in the Northeast. And so now you get a feel for how to display this. And the default uh, frame delay is 100 milliseconds. So if you wanted to slow this down, you would increase that number in milliseconds. So 500 would be a half a second per frame. And then you could uh, in decrease that number to make the animation go faster. So we'll go ahead and pause that and let's load up a different hourly image at this point. I'm gonna load up the total column zero to 200 centimeter relative soil moisture. And so that's RSM int 0 to 200 centimeters. And one thing to note in the behavior of this viewer is that it resets back to the first, to, to the most recent 20 images. So we're back to May 17th to 18th at this point. So let's go back and do those two weeks, first two weeks of May. The good thing is that when you load a start and ending image, it will show up in that menu when you select your start time. It will show up in the among the available times. It will zoom right back into the range of times that you had previously loaded. So now we're back to the first two weeks of May when we load that starting and ending image, and we can go ahead and animate that again. So let's load up a different view region. We're going to go back to the list menu, click on it to expand all the regions. And let's look at the Midwest at this point. And again, it's going to load up the default image of 0 to 100 centimeters relative soil moisture. And we're back to the, the most recent 20 images once again. 
So at this point, let's load a new field up. We're going to look at the grid point percentile for 0 to 100 centimeters. So we'll select that and load that up. Now, one thing to note is that the percentile images have one image per day as opposed to one image per hour in many of the other fields. Other fields that are daily frequency include the Veers green vegetation fraction down here. So if we look at the 20 most recent images now, it's going to be the last 20 days. So again, if we wanted to look at the first two weeks of May, notice that there's a frequency of just one per day at this point. So we can select the starting and ending images. And we have now a, a two-week loop of one image per day of the uh, percentile here. So the last thing I want to demo here is to uh, what you can do is when you create an animation, then you can go ahead and download that animated GIF and save it to your local system. So let's click on Download GIF. And at this point, you can choose the, you can alternatively choose the delay you want per, between frames, or you can enter the actual number here. It loads up 100 milliseconds per frame by default. And it's usually good to lag the final frame so that way when you're animating the image, it's going to increase the dwell rate, the delay in that last image before resetting and showing the beginning of the animation. So if we click on Get Animation, it's going to prepare that animated GIF at this point. And uh, once that becomes ready for download, it's going to prepare it on the system. Takes a little moment. The more frames you have in an animation, the longer it's going to take for that animation to be prepared for download. OK, at this point, we have the preview of the animated GIF showing up in a thumbnail view below. And now we can click on Download Animation. And you can select whatever folder you want to save it on your local system. You click Save. And now you have this animated GIF on your system. So let's just go back one last item here. And I did want to point out that most of these geographical zooms are valid for the sportless CONUS run over the continental US. But there are a few outside the CONUS runs. We have a run over Africa, Eastern Africa. So if we click on this, this brings up our real time sport list run that's over Eastern Africa. And there's a smaller subset of images available, but we still have a variety of fields there. And on this same run here, we can zoom into Kenya. We had one of our international collaborators using sport list data over Kenya. And we have we have a list Alaska run, which is available here and it's divided up also into north and south parts of Alaska. And we also have a one kilometer Caribbean list run that extends from Mexico all the way to the Eastern Caribbean. Currently, we only provide graphics over Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands uh, for collaborators in San, the San Juan National Weather Service office. But we do have uh, geotiffs available for the entire Caribbean list domain. So that's all I want to show today. and. Hopefully you find this web page interface easy to use and very convenient for examining different uh, sport lists output. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, Jonathan, for the terrific demonstration. We'll now go to Matthew Smith to learn about using the sport website for accessing near-real-time data as geotiffs, accessing near-real-time data from the NASA Disasters Portal, and visualizing the data in QGIS. Matthew, over to you. Thank you. I'm Matt Smith. Sport is pleased to partner with RSET to bring you this training today. I'll be sharing some of the ways you can access near real time sport list CONUS data for use in drought related applications. 
two main points today, where to get SportLiz files and how to use SportLiz GeoTIFF files. I should mention first that near real-time SportLiz imagery is available at the Sport website and our Sport viewer. For non-image data, these are available on Sport's file server at the link shown at the top. There are several formats available. First, GRIB2 or gridded binary files. These are files created specifically for distribution to National Weather Service forecast offices for their use in their decision support system called AWIPS. Next, PNGs and GeoTIFFs located in the same directory on the server. These files contain one variable each, so the file names describe the variable within. The variables are listed here. Portable network graphics files are CONUS images, as you can see, in a simple cylindrical equidistant projection, along with a legend and color map. Also, there are two types of geotiffs available, one with actual floating point values with the string float in the file name, and another with one byte values with the string byte scaled in the name. The byte scaled file is already mapped to a color scale the same one as shown in the Sport Data Viewer and here as well. And soil moisture histograms, animated GIFs of 30, 60, and 90 days in length. We've taken relative soil moisture data from 1981 to 2013 for 33 years for 33 counties across the US. As seen here, these show how each day compares statistically with the full 33 years of data. The NASA Earth Science Disasters Program operates their mapping portal at the link shown. It's a web mapping service site where you can view several important near real-time geophysical parameters, including six sport list products for CONUS and four for Alaska. They also provide REST service links so you can access these products in your own GIS package, in addition to simply downloading GeoTIFFs yourself. So, how can you explore GeoTIFF files on your own? There are basically two options. First, you can write your own software. There are several languages that allow you to read, write, and manipulate GeoTIFFs. Python is the most extensive with many libraries available. Also, C++ and other libraries offer, offer libraries as well. And even IDL JavaScript offer APIs. Also, newer collaborative tools like Google Colab might be helpful. The other option is to simply use one of the GIS packages available. I said simply, but these are powerful packages with lots of analysis options, and most of them have significant learning curves. The top proprietary GIS package on the market is produced by the company Esri. Their main GIS software app is ArcMap, but their next generation package, ArcGIS Pro, will replace it in the next few years. There are many other GIS packages on the market several of which are free and open source. Today, I'll focus on the most popular open source package, QGIS or QGIS. It's available for multiple operating systems and is very popular in the science community. Since this is not a QGIS training course and we're short on time, we'll just briefly demonstrate how to visualize two GIF raster images, one downloaded from our file server and one downloaded from the Advanced Hydrologic Prediction Service or AHAPS, and a REST service link to the disasters mapping portal. So let me get over here to QGIS, and I'd like to start a new project, so follow along with me. On the top menu, New, and there I have a new project, and I'd like to add two layers. So I slick, collect, select the layer option, Add Layer, and Add Raster Layer. I'll make sure the file source type is chosen. Click on the ellipsis on the far right here. Select the two files I want, open, and then I can click on the add button. That will load the two layers. This is the sport one here with the word float, um, the floating point values, and this is the one from AHAPS. So as you can tell, they look a little strange at this moment, so let's take care of that. I double click on the sport list layer. Within the 
left side panel, I choose symbology. I change render type to single band pseudo color. Since these are percentiles, I want to change the min max from 1 to 100. I'm going to leave the color map alone and click OK. All right, there's our soil moisture values. And now let's take a look at the AHAPS product. I'll double click that. Once again, the layer properties, I want to change in the symbology panel on the left, change render type to single band pseudo color again. This has four bands, but I happen to want band one, which is the observed rainfall for the month of April of this year. And I'm going to set this from zero to 10 inches of rainfall. Again, I leave the color ramp alone, click OK, and there I've got a layer for April rainfall. All right, now I'd like to go back to the disasters mapping portal. If I scroll down to the disaster topics, click on near real time products, it takes me to this page where I see lots of their products that are available. I want to get the LIS CONUS soil moisture percentile for zero to 200 centimeters. And I want to click on the text, not the image, which takes me to a description page. There's a lot of metadata about the product, but I'm really concerned with this URL right here, which is the REST endpoint. And I can copy it, dismiss that, go over here to QGIS, and this time I want to add a layer down here. It's called ArcGIS REST server layer. All right, I'm going to create a new connection. I'm going to give it a, a, a name. And I want to paste with Control V on my system what I just copied a second ago for the REST server connection and click OK. Now I need to click the Connect button, select the layer I want, and choose Add at the bottom. And I instantly see a layer there. I'm going to close this window now. And there you go. There is the REST server layer, which is showing the volumetric soil moisture percentiles for the full two meter column. And that is the most recent data. And I can turn these layers on and off and reorder them in any way I choose, change their transparency, their colors, and lots of other options. One final point before I am done. Sport plans to make all of its sport list product data available at the Global Hydrology Resource Center, which is one of NASA's Distributed Active Archive Centers, or DACs. Our goal is to make this happen in calendar year 2023. You can see the various types of data that will be archived and available there. And that's it. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Matt, for the great demonstration of accessing near real-time data and visualizing the data in QGIS. We'll now go to Ryan Wade to learn how to use Google Colab and Jupyter for displaying and differencing sport Liz soil moisture data. Ryan, over to you. Hey, hello everybody. Welcome to the working with data in Jupyter Notebooks portion of session three on the application of NASA Sport Land Information System soil moisture data for drought. Uh, the authors of this are Robert Janad and Ryan Wade. I am Ryan Wade. So what we'll do is we will go through this Jupyter Notebook example. We'll scroll through. There are no PowerPoint slides for this portion. We may go to some other tabs just so that you can see where to get some of the data from. And we'll go ahead and take it away. So once again, this particular session, you've all heard about the NASA Land Information System, flexible land surface modeling and data assimilation framework. And so 
with this uh, land mo uh, surface modeling concept, right? This includes several parameters within this, including precipitation, all parts of the hydrologic cycle, basically. Uh, precipitation, long wave and short wave radiation, evapotranspiration, energy balance, and then that infiltration into the soil moisture. That's what we've been focused on so far with this list for drought course with the applications for list for drop course specifically the purpose of this module is to introduce you to working with list data within a python framework with a focus on geotiff georeferenced raster data there are other data types for lists you can find, especially with GRIB1 and GRIB2 data as well. You may also find some list data out there that has net CDF, but specifically to the sport lists run, we typically have GRIB data and GeoTIFF data, okay, which can be imported into multiple GIS frameworks. For this, we're going to use this Jupyter Notebook in order to work with that GeoTIFF georeferenced raster data. Now, we are in Google Colab, and so you should have started this up. You should have gone to the NASA RSET uh, GitHub page, specifically with the NASA RSET Sport List GitHub page. And from there, you can access this Python notebook as well as some of the data that's there. As I scroll down here, you'll notice that, um, that we do have this data uh, both posted on the uh, on the NASA RSET GitHub page, and you can also find this in the Geo server on the NASA Sport website. Okay, so let's go ahead and take things away with this Google Colab. The benefits of running things within Google Colab are that you don't have to install Python onto to your local machine. Everything that you are running is in the Google Cloud. So when you go through and install all of these different packages, when you're working with data, everything is primarily pulling from the cloud. So this section, we'll go ahead and get going with the Jupyter Notebook. There's a couple of ways that you can interact if you're not familiar with Google Colab and Jupyter Notebooks. We can run these individual cells of data either by hitting the little play button or by highlighting some text or highlighting one of these cells and then holding down the shift key and hitting the enter or return key depending on what operating system you are working with, what type of computer, whether it's a Mac, Linux, or a Windows-based, or even a Google Chromebook. So we'll go ahead and get things going and this is cell you would only run if you are using Google Colab. What we've done is we've made sure that you are installing the correct version of these specific packages so that they work well together within Google Colab virtual environment. So I'll go ahead and run this. And the first thing is it's, it's going out to the web and it's downloading and installing libproj develop and project data and project bin. Also libgeos. Cython, Cardopy. Cardopy is key when you are doing any type of GIS based georeferenced uh, work. Rio X array, so that you can use arrays efficiently when you are transforming your data arrays. And then we'll also uh, install the correct instance of Cardopy here. Additionally, in order to reshape some of these. Uh, files, uh, so some of these arrays, uh, you will need something called Shapely. Now, this goes ahead, and if you notice, we have a pip uninstall Shapely and then a pip install Shapely with no binary. And that's because there are conflicts between Cardopy and Shapely. So we're uninstalling the uh, native version of that that already comes with Cardopy, and then we're reinstalling the version of Shapely that works well with Cardopy. So as you see here on my screen, it only took 23 seconds to download and install all of these beginning packages. For you, it may take up to two to three minutes depending on your, uh, uh, your internet connection and bandwidth. 
So I'll go ahead and scroll down just so that you can see, you can collapse these uh, so that you don't see every bit of text as, as part of this, uh, as, as part of running these packages. But if you wanted to go through an error, uh, you know, error check and troubleshoot, it's got every piece as you scroll down. And then finally looking at that successfully installed Shapely, successfully installed this and this and this and that. Okay, so we'll go ahead and move forward. The other thing that we've done for you as part of this Jupyter Notebook is that we have gone ahead and made sure that you have all the packages that you need to, um, to, to run all of the plotting and data routines and functions within Google Colab. We've created functions for you so that you can mimic the color map, the color bar, the color scale that you'll find in the NASA Sport Viewer. For example, if I go over to this other tab, you can see I already have in the NASA Sport Viewer uh, some of the list data, the zero to 10 centimeter relative soil moisture, and all of this uh, the, this function that that we're about to go into will go. It has it's hard coded the color map so that it mimics our color map. You can go in and create your own RGB color map. So the first thing we'll go ahead and and import warnings, and we'll go ahead and import a few other uh, packages. Once again, it's not downloading. These have already been downloaded, but these are being imported and installed, such as NumPy, Rio X-Array, CardoPy, and we're doing this shortcut where we import CardoPy CRS as CCRS so that we can more efficiently call specific features from and specific functions from CardoPy. So CardoPy feature is CF, Cardopi IO shape reader uh, as SHP reader and matplotlib as PLT so that we can uh, access those plot commands more efficiently and then some of the uh, importing some of the color maps and, and boundaries. So once again, I've run these. These only took about a second, maybe even less to run, at least on my computer here. The color map below, once again, we have hard coded and defined our RGB color maps so that they match the NASA Sport Viewer. I'll go ahead and scroll down just before running this so you, that you can see it, but we're defining the color map for relative soil moisture, RSM, volumetric soil moisture, VSM, green vegetation fraction, GVF, any of our change, when we're doing a change from one volumetric soil moisture to another or one relative soil moisture to another, we have a color map specific to those when you're doing any kind of one week, one month, two months, six months changes. And we also have our percentile color maps for all of those. And then you can see we create a dictionary here uh, for these that you will then call this function and your specific uh, variables and parameters from the dictionary later on when we're working with the data and we're plotting. So I'm gonna scroll back up and go ahead and run this particular cell. Did not take very long to do at all. Okay, so we'll go ahead and scroll down and you can, once again, you can collapse these so that you don't see all of these, but I'm gonna go ahead and leave these up so that you can see them. We also go into our date time so that it will read the date time uh, from the file names. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and take just a brief pause here for a moment in case you need to uh, get caught up just for about five to 10 seconds. And then we'll go on to our specific drop monitor examples. Everything that we've done so far is just prepping so that we can work with our data. We have everything that we need to efficiently create plots. Okay, great. Hopefully you're caught up at this point. And now we're going to move into actually reading in, downloading and reading in the NASA sport list data and plotting that data. So what I've done here is I've used an example from the drought monitor, the U.S. drought monitor from September of 2022. In this specific case, the drought monitor, the U.S. drought monitor author, authors were trying to make decisions on 
what level of drought, once again, intensity is over here, none, D0, abnormally dry, D1, moderate drought, D2, severe drought, D3, extreme drought, and D4, exceptional drought. So they had to make decisions. And one of these was specifically on this area in central Arkansas, actually a good bit of Arkansas. And so our goal will is to mimic as if you were a drought monitor author and you wanted to create your own visualization of NASA sport data to more efficiently be able to conduct your analyses. So your goal is to create a CONUS view similar to the U.S. drought monitor maps of volumetric soil moisture percentile to aid in your analysis. So I have this nice image here from the U.S. Drought Monitor from the end of September of 2022 as a guide for what you're going to do for the NASA Sport list data. So once again, we would start by downloading and reading in the Sport list data in GeoTIFF format. Specifically, we're going to start with just pulling in the 0 to 10 centimeter volumetric soil moisture percentile product. We're gonna start with the shallowest layer for right now. Now, once again, this can be done through the NASA Sports uh, Geo Server, and we will have some of this data both on the Geo Server as well as on the uh, NASA RSET GitHub page as well. But for this, anything that has a hash uh, or pound symbol is commented out. So I have this set up so that you can be ready to go ahead and access some of that. Uh, and I'll show you where to get that. Once again, if you go to this particular directory, geo.ndc.nasa.gov slash sport, this is what this uh, site looks like. And if you were just to go to the sport website, the geo.ndc.nasa.gov uh, directory here at the bottom, you would click on sport. Then you would click on modeling and you would go to LIS, L-I-S. Now from there, it really depends on what data you want. We have data for Africa, three kilometer data for Africa. We have data for Alaska, right? And what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and uh, the Caribbean, and we're gonna go ahead and pick the CONUS, continental United States, three kilometer data. From here, you can see there's all sorts of data that's out there, some that are in AWIPS format for the weather service, some forecasts, histograms, all sorts of things, and even you can find some of the GRIB data, but we're working with GeoTIFFs. So I go ahead and click on GeoTIFFs, and you have all of these here. You have green vegetation fraction, you have relative soil moisture, zero to 10 centimeters, you have some differencing, some 14 day, seven day differencing, relative soil moisture, zero to two meter, which is the zero to 200 centimeter percentile data, um, relative soil moisture, zero to two meter, volumetric soil moisture, zero to 10 centimeters, and the volumetric soil moisture percentiles. If I click on that, then you can see that you have a wealth of data to access from the VSM. You can uh, access the, the volumetric soil moisture percentiles for zero to 10 centimeters, zero to 40 centimeters, zero to 100 centimeters, and zero to 200 centimeters. All of these in this particular uh, folder here in this directory are all live data. What we're doing here is we're working off of some archived data. But if you wanna go grab the live data, there it is, you know where to access it now. Okay, so I'm going ahead and accessing some archived data. Once again, specifically, we're uh, go ahead and setting the base geo URL where we get the data from, the specific directory as a variable. And then we're going to combine that with the actual file name. For the actual file name, we're going ahead and we're going to pull this in from 2022, September 30th at 0Z for the volumetric soil moisture, 0 to 10 centimeter percentile data for the entire continental United States at three kilometer grid spacing. We'll use this uh, as a data structure. We'll open that up in the uh, raster IO. Use that because raster IO is an important package that allows you to read in raster data, especially geotiffs, very efficiently. So then we will go ahead and run this cell. It's going out to get that data, and then it's downloading it 
putting it in virtual memory and reading it in to these specific variables and data structures. One of note that we have for read in, I've set this up here at the top so that it's doing this for the volumetric soil moisture percentiles. If you wanted to do this for relative soil moisture, uh, the volumetric soil moisture, not the percentiles, okay? If you wanted to do green vegetation fraction, or if you wanted to do some of the difference data, the you would just copy and paste these sections up here in place of where it says hash VSM zero to 10 centimeter percentile. Notice that under product type, you need to be sure and specify the product type, whether it's a percentile, relative soil moisture, volumetric soil moisture, green vegetation fraction or change because that's going to the specific product back up in the function that defined our color maps and defined our products in that dictionary. So the way that we've set it up because we've hard coded this to give you this example, you need to be sure and go and specify the actual product. I'll scroll up one more time just so that you can see where the product is. There's the percentile, there's the change in the color map, there's the green vegetation fraction, there's the volumetric soil moisture, and there is the relative soil moisture. Okay, so let's scroll back down. And this is not a cell that you're gonna read in, this is just a note so that you know that you can copy and paste that up in the cell above. Okay, so let's go ahead and plot this. I'll go ahead and we set our color map, our levels, and our product type for the file that we just read in. We do our appropriate projection for this. We go ahead and uh, reorient our data that fits to our map and our projection. We go ahead and set our coastlines our state boundaries and labels, and we have this set to go ahead and automatically pull in the label that's here at the top of the plot based on the file name. So I'll go ahead and run this for you. Run this, and it'll take a moment for it to go ahead and set up the palette, bring in all of the appropriate uh, functions to then read in that data and plot it the way that we have asked it to plot. Now we have not specified any type of a lat long boundary. We're just doing it for the uh, for that entire data plot, which is, for this is the continental United States is the default. So you can see here for the vo volumetric soil moisture zero to 10 centimeter percentile, you can see very low percentile for volumetric soil moisture through Oklahoma, Missouri, Iowa, Minnesota, and the Dakotas as well as Arkansas. Okay, well, that's great. So if you're a US drought monitor, you're like, okay, well, wait a second, we didn't have Arkansas in the D2 drought but last week, you know, or last month, but we have to make a decision. So let's go ahead and take a moment and let's zoom in, specifically to Arkansas. So, now you're a U.S. drought monitor, author, considering whether to include Central Arkansas in the D2 severe drought category. Based on this need, you decide to create a zoomed in view for Arkansas with the counties overlaid, just like this U.S. drought monitor state plot. And you want to go ahead and do this so that with that county data, it has that specificity so you know which counties to include and which counties to not. Okay, so the first thing you have to do is download the county-based shape files. I've gone ahead and downloaded that for you and I've posted that to my own personal server space here. This will also be available on the NASA RSET GitHub page as well at the time of this uh, course. And so you can also find it there. So with this particular cell, you can also find this out on the web. You have to download it, un unzip it, and then have all of the data ready as a shape file. If you look at this, what I have here is I have the county shape file 
in a directory, it's got the database file, it's got the project file, it's got the .sbx, .sbx .shp, it's got the .sxml, the .shx, it's got all of these files that are needed. It's not just the .shp file, you need to be able to access all of these in the same directory if you've never worked with any of this GIS-based data before. Okay. So this cell will read, it will uh, download and read in the county-based shapefile data uh, using the reader.geometries and using Shapely. Once again, Shapely was an important package for us to download and make sure that we had the correct version of it, the non-binary version. Okay, so we've read that in, took four seconds on my computer. So now let's go ahead and zoom in. We're gonna create our plot, set our color map, overlay our coastlines and county borders um, onto that. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna set custom bounds for our zoom in view. We're gonna do 32 degrees north to 37 degrees north and 95 degrees west to 89 degrees west. And that's what we've done here. All of this up here at the top is exactly the same as the continental US portion of it, okay? Everything up here is exactly the same. The only thing that's different is that we have now set an axe.set underscore extent. And from this, within these brackets, we've put in negative 95, negative 89 for our longitude, positive 32, positive 37 for our latitudes. Let's go ahead and run this cell and let that do its work. Okay, for me, it took nine seconds. For you, if you're on a wireless network or something like that, because once again, we're all working from the cloud and we're working from, uh, you know, from, from Google Colab, it could take a little bit longer depending on your bandwidth, things like that. So the, here is the volumetric soil moisture for zero to 10 centimeters percentile. And once again, you can see, you know, extremely dry for that shallow near surface layer in through Western Arkansas and relatively dry through most of Central Arkansas. And then once again, over here into the Arkansas Delta, it, you know, exceptionally dry uh, for that, that shallow near surface layer, that zero to 10 centimeters. Okay, well, once again, as I just mentioned, this is valid only for a single day at a single depth. And the volumetric soil moisture at zero to 10 is fine if you're looking at, you know, immediate impacts in anywhere from minutes to hours to a day or maybe a little bit more for, you know, precipitation impacts on soil moisture. But if you're looking at drought, and trying to decide, you really want to be able to probe deeper and deeper into that depth. You want to be able to dig into the zero to 40, the zero to 100, and even that zero to 200, depending on the time scales and depending on the, the impact and severity of that lack of precipitation. So let's say you want to dig into this data a little bit deeper, both literally and figuratively you want to create a four panel plot of these various depths for the volumetric soil moisture percentiles to aid in your analysis. Okay, well, that's great. So what we've done is we've created a, pan of, a, a cell here that defines the depths, zero to 10, zero to 40, zero to 100, zero to 200, which is the zero to two meter. And we've done a nice little wildcard character in here so that it will go out and define our files into an array and it will go and grab the specific file names based on the depth. Okay, and then we'll put all of that into a dictionary. So we'll go ahead and run that. If you don't want to use the, the wildcard character for geo URL, you can just go ahead and give the entire file name, the entire URL if you know where those are located. 
this is just trying to make things a little bit more efficient and customizable for you. But you can go ahead and list each one of those individually with the full file name with the full URL path. So I'm going to go ahead and run that. And it's once again going out, downloading it, creating it, putting it into a dictionary. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and define some of these parameters into a dictionary, and then we're going to go ahead and do a check because we're doing a four panel plot. We got to make sure that there's only four inputs. So we'll go ahead and run this to make sure that we uh, uh, both, once again, go ahead and make sure that we define our parameters. We check to make sure there's only four data inputs. We have a nice little error message if it doesn't. We go ahead and set our figure plot. And then from there, we loop through our dictionary to pull the appropriate file names and parameters from that, from, from uh, what we just read in. And we also assign the appropriate color maps based on the product type. Okay, then once again, we go ahead and set our coastlines and we set our state boundaries and we set our counties that we just did and we set our title everything that we did before we're also going to keep it with the same extent axis extent here negative 95 to negative 89 longitude 32 and 37 north latitude and then we'll go ahead and create our four panel plot okay let's go ahead and do that we've loop through there and it has created a four it set up the panel and now let's create the plot have that as a second uh panel for a uh, second cell for execution here but what we did in the previous cell was we set everything up so that we're ready to plot and we're pulling in everything from our dictionary there's our product type looping through those files and making sure that we have our counties plotted on here. And by the way, if you don't like the way that the borders are set and you don't like the way that the state borders or the county borders, you can come up here and you can change it. You can change the line width for the counties. You can change the line style for the counties. You can change that for the states. You can change those all up here in the previous cell states line width you can change the thickness of the line width for the state borders you can change the county line style and line width you can change the face color right now i, I have it set as none which by default makes it gray so there's your four panel volumetric soil moisture zero to 10 centimeters percentile the zero to 40 the zero to 100 and the zero to 200 and you can see that through arkansas this lack of precipitation has really greatly impacted the shallowest soil moisture. It's definitely dry in that zero to two meter, which is that zero to 200 centimeters, but the, the closer you get to the surface, you see that impact. But you can really see that the zero to 10, zero to 40, and zero to 100, it's pretty dry. Now, of course, the U.S. Drought Monitor uses other products and a convergence of evidence approach, but you can see why they decided to put Arkansas, much of central Arkansas, into D2 drought. Okay, so what we've done in review so far is we have read in our data, multiple types of geotiffs from multiple file names, and we've pulled in and we've created custom plots. First, we started at the continental United States, and I'll scroll back up for that, to match the US Drought Monitor's continental United States map. We've taken a zoom in level for Arkansas, brought in shape files for counties, and we've created a volumetric soil moisture percentile zoomed in to Arkansas. And then we wanted to dig down into some additional depths so that we could more deeply analyze the impact of the lack of rain on soil moisture. And we've created products based on that, a four panel product. So I think this is a good opportunity for us to take a pause just for a moment 
before we go into our international examples, I'll pause for about five to 10 seconds for you to kind of get caught up. And if you're following along in real time, then a great opportunity for you to go, uh, get caught up. If you're following later on with a recorded example, then it's a great opportunity for you to hit pause and then go back and run those cells yourself interactively. Okay, so we will forge on and we've got just a couple of international examples specifically focused on Africa. And then we will do some, back, come back to CONUS and do some uh, custom differencing uh, to wrap things up. So let's say that you're interested in relative soil moisture plots for all of Africa and then to be able to zoom in on a specific area. Well, we've done this for the United States, so it's, it's not that different. The only thing that you really have to change is, you know, okay, the file names and maybe your lat launch bounds. Okay, so first thing we're gonna do is read in our relative soil moisture data for Africa. For this, I have this on my uh, web server here, but you can also find this once again on the NASA RSET GitHub page as well. And so we're going to read in from this geo, geo URL, the Africa data from 2021, November 1st. And specifically, we're gonna take a look at the list relative soil moisture for the 10 centimeter to 40 centimeter for all of Africa at three kilometer grid spacing. I've left several other parameters and products in here so that all you have to do is remove the hash and comment those out. But once again, the important thing here is to have the file in to assign that variable and the product type, P type which is RSM relative soil moisture. Then once again, we have to come down here to open our file using raster IO with the name, with the file that we just uh, put into our, our variable. And we have to make sure that we are uh, specifying our, uh, our, our uh, product type. In this case, um, the, the product type it's just going to check to make sure it's not volumetric soil moisture. And if it's not, then it's going to go ahead and multiply everything by 100 um, so that we can deal with things in terms of percent. OK, so you don't have to change this here. This is just simply a check to make sure that it's not volumetric soil moisture. If it's not, then it multiplies everything by 100 to make sure it's not that. that. OK, so I'm going to go ahead and run this cell so we've read in this Africa data and now once again same thing we're going to set our color map we're going to set our level levels our label and based on the labels we'll use our product type and the name of the file and it will cut out part of that file name as to to uh, seed our title here at the top of the plot we set our figure canvas our axes our projection we transform our data to fit our map we bring in the right color map and that's really it right we make sure that we have our coastlines we make sure that we have our borders notice that i'm not using the states because we're not using the continent of the united states so i removed that from our previous uh, uh cells our previous parts of the script and we'll go ahead and run this and it's reading in that geo tiff of the three kilometer data from africa Okay, so there we go. We have Africa, we have our available water, which is our relative soil moisture in percent. Once again, the relative soil moisture is a percent of saturation. Okay, it's a percent of saturation, whereas the volumetric soil moisture is the percent of the column, but this is relative soil moisture, and we've created our plot. You can see very dry up here towards the Sahara. You have a lot higher relative soil moisture down here in the Congo. 
and it's particularly dry over here in the southeastern portions of the African continent. So going back to the sport viewer, one of our default areas on the sport viewer, if you look at lists, is Africa. And we have Africa, Kenya as well. And so let's go ahead and say that we're going to take this Africa data and we're going to create a similar zoomed in plot that focuses more towards Southeast Africa. So I want to mimic this plot here. Okay, well, let's scroll down. And this right here is an example from the sport list viewer. It's also got precipitation contours on there as well. We're not going to create that, but we're basically going to try to mimic this zoomed in view. You can see that we're looking at approximately 22, 23 degrees north, about 22, 23 degrees south, about you know 53 degrees east, and about you know 26, 27 degrees east. Okay, well, we'll try to mimic this the best we can. We've already read in the data. All we have to do is change the palette for our plot based on our custom bounds. So everything up here at the top of this cell is exactly the same as what we see for our entire continental plot for Africa. Nothing has changed between this here in our plot and the top part of this cell. The only thing that we're doing is, once again, we're calling that axe.set underscore extent. And by the way, if you hover over it, you get some of the, uh, you know, some, some of the uh, uh, parameters, some of the specific info. That's one of the nice things about Jupyter Lab. But we're gonna go ahead and set this for 22 degrees east to 53 degrees east and then negative 22 degrees latitude, which is 22 degrees south, and positive 21 degrees latitude, which is 21 degrees north. That's approximately what we see here on our original plot that we also see in the sport viewer. Okay, so we'll go ahead and run this cell. And once again, you can combine all of this into scripts to optimize and automate but we're all doing this in Jupyter Notebooks, Jupyter Lab, because it's interactive and you can see these things in real time. Okay, great. So you can see back from November 1st of 2021, really dry in our, uh, in, in our, uh, our relative soil moisture in that 10 to 40 degree, which is a 10 to 40 centimeters, which is really a key layer to look for when it comes to drought. Okay, so we've created a nice customized Zoom area for this international example. Okay, so I'll take about another five seconds and then we'll wrap things up with a custom difference example. Okay, welcome back. So now we're going to come back to the continental United States with our sport list custom differencing example. So what we have here already default plotted, and I just pulled this straight from the sport viewer, was a one month difference in column relative soil moisture percent. Well, let's say that you don't want a one month. Let's say that, that you're part of the drought monitor or some other, you know, drought, you're, you're, you're assessing drought and you want to do something for six months or maybe one week or two weeks and you want to see just what has happened, especially maybe you are looking at flash drought and you want to really look at that one week and two week change or maybe even three week in relative soil moisture. You don't want one month, three months, six months. Okay, so let's take a look at what we would do in order to do this. All right, so I've got some of these cells are hidden. I'm gonna go ahead and expand these out and scroll down. Now, once again, we will read in our data 
And what we're gonna do is we're gonna start with a one week relative soil moisture, zero to two meter difference plot. And everything that we've been looking at has been for September 30th of 2022. So let's grab data from both September 30th of, of 2022, as well as September 23rd of 2022, so that we can do a one week difference. So here, file one, we're gonna grab our relative soil moisture, zero to two meters, and we will go ahead and read in that 2022 0930 for the relative soil moisture of zero to two meters for the continental United States, three kilometer, and we're gonna use the float data. We'll go ahead and open it up using, once again, raster IO, and put it into our first data structure, DS1. We'll also read in file number two, which is going to be from September 23rd, one week prior. Our product type, once again, is relative soil moisture. You have to have that product type here, the way that we've set up this notebook. And we'll read it into data structure number two with raster IO. Then what we'll do is create a data structure number three, where we'll say data structure number one, which is the most recent, which is September 30th, and subtract from that one week ago, September 23rd. Now, what's important here is that you change your product type. Notice that the product type up here was relative soil moisture. Now we're doing a differencing. Now we're doing a change. So with this change, we will set that because we need that for our color map. All right, so we'll go ahead and run this. Took two seconds, not bad. So we're reading everything in and putting it into the appropriate data structures and doing our differencing. Now we're setting up our plot exactly like we did before. No difference here. And I've went ahead and left this commented out where if you wanted to do some kind of custom bounds, it's ready for you. But we're just gonna go ahead and do the entire continental United States. For our relative soil moisture, zero to two meter difference plot between the 30th and the 23rd. We'll go ahead and run this. And you can see what that percent difference is. For example, in, Arcan in parts of Arkansas which, that we focused on before, it's down anywhere from 2% to 4%. Along the Gulf Coast, there are par parts of it that the one week change in relative soil moisture for the total column from zero to 200 centimeters it's down anywhere from 4% to 8%. Meanwhile, on the lee side of Lake Erie, in November, probably some lake effect rain, lake effect snow, or well, probably some lake effect rains um, in, in September, you see that it's actually up. That one week relative soil moisture in that total column is actually up anywhere from 8% to 16%. In Florida, hmm, we've got some interesting things going on here, right? Potentially some tropical activity along the Florida Peninsula. It's up as much as anywhere from 24 to 28% in some areas just off of Cape Kennedy in Florida. Okay, so now let's say that you want to do a zero to two. Well, then you just change. You change that. Once again, we're going to do read in the ninth, uh, September 30th. Then we're gonna read in September 13th, uh, September 16th rather, S still, and we're going to read this in. And once again, our product type is RSM, but we're, air, but we're checking to make sure it's not volumetric soil moisture. So this is where you need to change your product type, not up here, don't change this part. We've done our differencing, we've done our plot. I just combined it all into a single plot and then there's our difference in our soil moisture. I'll run that one more time just so that you can see it. Our two week relative soil moisture difference. You can see how dry, it's down four to 8%, even some areas as much as eight to 12% in parts of Arkansas, Mississippi, along the Texas, uh, along the Gulf Coast even up into parts of the Midwest. And once again, we see 
uh, increases in soil moisture in that total column up into the northeast and down in Florida. Okay, so review. We've just gone through some international examples for some custom plotting and zooming, and we just did custom differencing where we did a one week and a two week. If you had data for three months, six months, a year, you can do all of the differencing and these plots. You have the color maps, you have the code, you have what you need to get you started all in a Google Colab framework so that you don't even have to install Python onto your local machine if you're not able to. And as one final follow-up for folks, just a reminder that after each session, we have self-paced items for homework, for completion, and you will have a separate Jupyter Notebook for you to use, that you will access some data, just like I did today, where you will go in and do some custom zooms, some four panel plots and custom differencing. And then you will take those images that you create and you'll have a one final image to upload as part of the homework lesson. Once again, thank you very much. We appreciate your attention and your interest in the sport version of the land information system. Thank you, Ryan, for the terrific demonstration on using Google Colab for displaying and differencing Sportliz soil moisture data. As we wrap up the webinar series, we'll go to Chris Hain, project lead for NASA Sport, to summarize the training and provide closing comments. Chris, over to you. Uh, thanks, Sean. Um, I hope you all had a chance to enjoy the hands-on experience from uh, from Ryan in the previous presentation and got a chance to work with the data and hopefully work with the data in the homework exercise coming up too. Um, so I wanted to provide a few closing statements uh, to the, 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 the three-part training that we put together here on, on our, our uh, sport Liz for drought. Uh, what you have there in the background is an animation showing. And I really just wanted to kind of go over how, you know, important um, Land service modeling systems like Sport Liz are for, for, for looking at things like drought and for other applications that we didn't cover in this training. Um, obviously, this is a community driven um, development, and we really do take a lot of the feedback that we get from stakeholders um, to, to better improve this system and to figure out how people are using it. Um, going forward, you know, there will be some improvements to the system focused on more forecast capabilities. Uh, we will also be hopefully refining and improving spatial resolutions, um, maybe going from three kilometers to one kilometer, um, and also looking at um, additional advanced data simulation capabilities. Uh, this really allows us, as you, as you saw some from the, some of the previous presentations, to better constrain some of the variables that we are predicting within the land surface model. Now, when we do all this stuff, we really do hope to improve the specification of drought because we understand how important this is for decision makers to get a really accurate representation of the current conditions um, so that those uh, maps can then be used to, to, to motivate things like the U.S. Drought Monitor, which then also tie into, um, you know, really on the ground impacts for agricultural producers, water managers, and other users who really rely on this information in their day to day. Uh, so it really is a, a nice uh, kind of encapsulation of taking research, creating a product that can then be used by our operational partners, and then, you know, bleeding down to actually being used by the general public. Uh, so when we all get into science, this is a, a good example of a project that we really wanted to, you know, take something that we, we develop and, and then, uh, you know, kind of transition it so that uh, it could have broad societal benefit. Uh, I do also want to close with saying that this training would not have been possible without many of the collaborators you heard from over the last three weeks. And I wanted to make sure that we recognize them again. Um, the group that we've been working with over the last decade has been a really great group. And um, it's really great to uh, engage with everything from the scientists and developers who developed the sport system and the sport list system and the list system at Goddard. And then also for the work with some of our users and see how they use the data in some of their decision making.
Um, so the first uh, group that we really like to uh, thank is Sujay Kumar and his team, uh, the Land Information System team at Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, we've collaborated with them for over a decade and we will continue collaborating with them to further refine our system and to really meet the needs of our, our end users. Uh, Chris White, uh, he's our applications integration meteorologist here at SPORT, but he's also a forecaster for the National Weather Service at the Huntsville office here. And um, he has really spearheaded the use of, of sport list data within the National Weather Service and to other agencies. Um, he's really our conduit from uh, the production side of this product and to the users. Uh, Richard Heim and other authors of the U.S. Drought Monitor, you know, these are the guys and women who have to really sit down every week and draw these lines uh, for the U.S. Drought Monitor that are, you know, a map that's really important and used for a lot of different policy and a lot of other different uh, decisions uh, for their downstream stakeholders. Um, and he's provided a great example of how uh, the U.S. Drought Monitor's authors are able to integrate different sets of information each uh, week uh, when it comes to producing their maps. Uh, also, I'd like to thank Corey Davis uh, from the North Carolina Climate Office. Um, he was also uh, gave a nice example of uh, how sport list data is used in some of his operational decision making. Um, and he has been a longtime user and promoter of the sport list system. Uh, Barrett Smith, um, a uh, National Weather Service hydrologist at the National Weather Service office in Raleigh. Uh, he also provided a nice example of uh, some of the, the uses of sport list data in his, is his, in his uh, decision making process. Um, and then, you know, I, we can't call it everybody, but the hundreds of people who we, we've collaborated with over the last decade and the users of SportLiz, um, we continue to see the system grow and we will continue to uh, hopefully continue to grow that system and grow the, the number of users um, who, who show benefit uh, from our system. And, you know, we always like to hear about how people are using the system uh, because then we can then tell our management here at NASA the kind of benefit of their investments. Um, and that helps facilitate further investments in some of the things that we're able to develop here at SPORT. So I just wanted to close with this, um, kind of bringing back our, our the first slide that I showed during the introduction. Um, really what um, SPORT is focused on is this research to operations and operations to research paradigm. And I kind of close with this, you know, obviously Sport Liz was developed uh, as a research to operations capability. Uh, we talked to the operational community and, and noticed that there was a need for high resolution land surface modeling with low latency to support things like drought monitoring. And so we developed that. And obviously the system is developed. Um, we're, we, we've, been, we've been maintaining it for almost a decade, but we're constantly in this kind of iterative process where we learn from our operational stakeholders on what could actually uh, be used to, to better improve or refine the system. Uh, so we're kind of constantly with this system in this operations to research process. And what I'd really like to do is you know, call out to the community is that our future developments are really driven by your the community needs and we need your feedback. So we like to hear about what is working in the system for you, what isn't working, and what you wish you could see in a system like this to better facilitate some of the decisions you have to make. So with that, I will close. I'll once again put our contact information up. Um, you can contact me as I'm uh, the principal investigator for SPORT, but also we have a support email which goes to our data production team. Uh, if you ever have issues with the SPORT list system, or if you would just like to provide some feedback on how you use it or something or a capability that you would like to see within the system. Uh, so with that, I will throw it back to Sean for uh, a couple of parting words in the training. And I would just like to once again, thank you all for attending this three week session. And we hope to hear from you and, and hear more about how you use our system. Thanks. Thanks, Chris, for the closing statements and acknowledgments uh, for Sport Liz contributors. I'd also like to acknowledge members of the Sport team that contributed to this training but were not presenters. Kevin Fuel, Liz Junod, Rob Junod, Lori Schultz, Amy McAllister, and Chris Schultz all helped in preparing the materials and coordinating each session of the webinar series. Big thanks to everyone on this slide. One last reminder, there will be one homework assignment for all three parts of the training. 
Answers must be submitted via Google Form, which can be accessed from the training page on the RSET website. Homework is now available with a due date of June 14th. A certificate of completion will be awarded to those who attend all live webinars and complete the homework assignment by the deadline. You will receive a certificate approximately two months after the completion of the course. Below is the contact information for today's trainers, along with links to the sport webpage, RSET webpage, and social media. If you enjoyed today's webinar, we hope you will sign up on the RSET listserv and social media to receive notifications of future trainings and other announcements. We will now transition to the question and answer portion of today's training. And we did want to leave you with a few course conclusions as well. So my apologies for jumping right into the Q&A session, but we did want to leave you with some of the applications of sport list for drought. And these are kind of the concluding, uh, the concluding uh, uh, thoughts from the entire three-part webinar series. Uh, the first one being the NASA Land Information System Modeling Suite is used globally by a wide variety of user and research groups for many applications related to land service processes, streamflow, groundwater, and data assimilation with direct application to drought. The sport configuration of, of LIS or sport LIS uses the NOAA land surface model forced by NLDAS 2 for a 1981 to 2013 climatological period, as well as GDAS and MRMS precipitation forcing in near real time. Sport LIS is, is unique in that it incorporates daily, daily satellite derived green vegetation fraction for near real time vegetation coverage and health, as opposed to a monthly static climatological estimate. The sport Liz output provides soil moisture over the entire contiguous United States at three kilometer resolution within layered depths to two meters. The analyses are updated four times a day in real time with hourly output frequency. Soil moisture percentiles product historical context of current soil moisture values relative to the 1981 to 2013 climatological period. The zero to 200 centimeter relative soil moisture percentiles compared favorably to the US drought monitor drought designations where soil moisture deficits strongly correlate with episodes of drought. Sport Liz has experimental forecasts of soil moisture percentiles out to 14 days using the US GFS forecast model as forcing, updated daily in real time. And lastly, Real-time LIS applications managed by SPORT are provided in several output data formats for the continental United States, Alaska, and the Caribbean, but there are also LIS instances that cover Africa and Southeast Asia for research activities. So with these concluding remarks, we will now transition to the question and answer session. And I do want to thank everybody that has submitted a question. And there's still plenty of time left in today's uh, training. So if you do have a question, please do submit it in the question box. But jumping right into it, uh, question number one, can you use this data outside of the United States of America? And whoever answered that, feel free to unmute. Hey, Jonathan Case here. Uh, so predominantly, uh, you notice that we highlighted it the continental US uh, sport configuration of the land information system. However, we do also have other international runs active that sport manages. And uh, we highlighted some of those earlier on in session three when I demoed the sport list viewer. And so some of those uh, runs and data output are available over Eastern Africa, Alaska, and the Caribbean regions. Uh, you can also get the full one kilometer Caribbean uh, domain via GeoTIFF, and I answered that in question two. But uh, and there's a lot of other app organizations that run international applications of LIS. Uh, so this this actually is pretty closely connected to question two, but I'll go ahead and let Sean read question two as well. Great, thanks, Jonathan. Uh, can you provide a few examples of where sport list data is available and how to find if data is available for my location? Okay, so uh, again, I'll reiterate that most of the content we highlighted here was for the sport list run 
that is over the continental U.S., and that does include adjacent parts of southern Canada and northern Mexico. However, the land information system framework, uh, I'd like to emphasize, is that it's fully global capable. So there's global data sets, as long as you have static and the meteorological forcing available in a global perspective, then LIS can support that. And you can configure the LIS framework to set up a domain anywhere across the globe. And so many organizations have done that. We ourselves at Sport have set up applications for some of our uh, sister organizations such as NASA Servir and uh, other international capacity building organizations and, and applications. And so we have we have examples of those on our sport list viewer over Eastern Africa, Alaska, and the Caribbean, specifically over Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. Uh, however, feel free to, to Google search and look through the land information system project page where they have a lot of other applications uh, such as uh, the South Asia land data assimilation system, the famine early warning. Uh, if you could scroll down a little bit, I'll define that. Yeah, the famine early warning systems network, which is over Africa. Uh, so there, there are a lot of applications of lists for drought monitoring, which includes stream flow and soil moisture deficits and even snow analyses. Great, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, question number three: From the different from the different depths, can the relative soil moisture or volumetric soil moisture of the depth be calculated? For example, zero to ten centimeters and zero to forty centimeters used to estimate the ten to forty centimeter depth profile. Yeah, and so actually, I'm going to start my response by reading my last sentence there. Uh, in essence, the order of operations is opposite of how the question was stated. So actually, the individual layers are solved by the NOAA or another land service model within LIS. And the, the variable that is directly solved is the volumetric soil moisture. And so that's going to give you the water content by volume in each of these layers, 0 to 10, 10 to 40. 40 to 100 and 100 to 200 centimeters as defined in the NOAA land service model. And from those primary fields that are solved in the equations within NOAA, we derive other fields such as the relative soil moisture, which is going to scale the volumetric soil moisture between the prescribed wilting and saturation points uh, at each given soil type or classification. And then we use the climatological outputs of the VSM and RSM to derive percentiles of soil moisture uh, for giving the climatological context. So I'd like to refer back to the session one content and specifically that online starter package micro lesson, which will help instill the concepts of how the land service model is run and how these uh, various fields are, are derived and generated. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much, Jonathan. Question four, where can we download previous archived data or non-near-time data? Yeah, and so I'll just keep on going then. So we are in the process of hosting the entire sportless archive, both the climatological outputs the percentiles and the near real-time output onto a distributed active archive center, uh, specifically at NASA's Global Hydrometeorology, Hydrometeorology Resource Center. So uh, we're actively uh, creating the archives and preparing them to be hosted on this DAC system. And once that is available with a goal of the end of this year, then we would, uh, have that data be completely and publicly available for download and perusal uh, for anyone else's applications. Terrific, and moving on, question number five. Can you explain whether it's possible to always reference the most recent file in the Google Colab script?
Hey, Sean, this is uh, Kevin Fuel at Sport. Um, I think uh, Ryan Wade and uh, Rob Janad probably, um, they might have had to go to a, a separate call, but they're probably the ones who probably could most easily uh, answer that question. We'll be sure to put an answer in here uh, so that folks can refer back to that. Great, Kevin. Yeah, thanks so much. I appreciate uh, appreciate that update. Uh, and then last question, uh, question number six, can you do a time series analysis of the data? Okay, I, this is Jonathan again. I'll, I'll take a stab at this one and, and I will refine the answer since I haven't prepared one yet, but this is an excellent question. And we have done time series analyses of the data. Uh, if you read in, say, uh, let's, uh, let's say we want to read in a year worth of data, there's a couple of ways of doing time series analysis. One way that I've done it in the past would be to look at time depth cross sections. And what you would do is have time along the x axis, and then you could have the depth of the land surface model layers and the y axis. And then you could see that explicitly that dry down through the soil layer at a particular latitude longitude point. So that could be an extension of what was presented here in the Google Colab script. Whereas once you read in, let's say a, a, a period of data, maybe a, a multiple months of daily data or an entire year, and then you could pick a specific point and then look at the time depth cross sections, which would show really nicely illustrating that rainfall events and dry downs leading into drought episodes. So that would be one way to do time series analysis. And another way that I've done it, uh, and it was published in a 2021 paper in the National Weather Association's uh, Journal of Operational Meteorology, where we looked at time series of the soil moisture percentiles over the entire 200 centimeter column. And we looked at these time series associated with the with extreme rainfall events in tropical cyclones that occurred in the sport list domain. And so one one thing you could see is the extreme increase in the percentiles to near the 100th percentile associated with a very high rainfall event. And then you could look at the time that it re is required to decline back to, say, near median percentiles uh, you know, in the months that follows an extreme rainfall event. And that can give you an a feel for how the land service model is adjusting to kind of nominal uh, atmospheric and rainfall conditions following an extreme event, as an example. So we'll try to write up that uh, rather comprehensive answer into the our response. But that, that's an excellent question and a, and a good way to analyze the sport list output, especially given its high temporal uh, frequency of outputs. Sean, this is uh, Kevin Fuel at Sport. If I could just add to what uh, John uh, indicated there. Uh, we have a little bit of experience with some of the time series analysis uh, via an instance of the list that was set up by Dr. Clay Blankenship uh, over Alaska. And so, for example, the similar plots that John was just talking about of looking at the various soil moisture at various depths um, our time series plots that Clay has created uh, in the past, and also some of the uh, surface-based uh, output, such as like snow cover or uh, snow water equivalent, uh, compared to like in situ observations have been time series that Clay has made. Now, I'll just make a little note that you know do need, you do need to be careful about uh, making those time series uh, versus uh, in situ observations for many of the reasons that we've stated in the past in terms of the um, you know limitations of you know, a three kilometer or whatever resolution you have pixel compared to a, a specific uh, point. So for example, when we were doing some of the uh, snow water equivalent comparisons, um, the elevation, for example, of um, the in situ site was maybe slightly different uh, than the actual uh, grid point within the list uh, Alaska domain that we were using. So you have to be a little bit careful when you do those comparisons, but we do have some of that experience and I think Clay would probably be willing to uh, share some of that experience with anyone that makes contacts with us via one of the emails at the top of the question and answer, or uh, that, that's accessible via the course. Wonderful, yeah, thanks so much, Kevin, and Jonathan as well.
Uh, well, it looks like we've gotten through all of the questions. Uh, for the gentleman or uh, gentlewoman who asked question number five, we will be uh, completing that question, we'll answer it, and we will post this to the training page. Uh, we, we're shooting for next week, so uh, if I know we did not get around to answering it in this, uh, in this live session, but it will be posted within a week, so please do go and, and look for and try to access the, the document then. I want to thank all the participants for joining us for all three parts of this webinar series. As a reminder, there, there is a homework assignment. It is currently active and accessible on the training page, so please do uh, go there if you wish to receive a certificate of completion for attending and completing this training. We do hope that you will uh, go and, and complete that homework. And we also want to let you know there will be a survey sent out sometime next week as well. And we hope that all of you that are, are taking it, we do hope that you will give us feedback. All of that feedback does go into iterating over subsequent training so that we can keep improving and making these trainings of, of, of the highest value to all those that are that are attending. So big thanks to everybody online. We also want to thank all of our guest presenters today. It's Jonathan Case, Matthew Smith, Ryan Wade, and Chris Hain for presenting in this third and final part of the webinar series. I also wanna thank the entire sport team for all the work that you've done into putting this uh, webinar series together. I also wanna acknowledge the RSET team as well for all the work that you did to, to be able to make this training of such a of high caliber to all the participants. So uh, we do hope that you will to see you again at a future RSET training and we wish you all the best in your future work. Thank you.